Hello. Thank you all for joining us for this seminar, Safer Roads, Active Transport and Healthier Communities, brought to you today by the School of Population Health and the City Futures Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rebecca Ivers. I'm head of the School of Population Health here at UNSW Sydney. I've had a long history in road safety research myself, so I'm delighted to be hosting this discussion today. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which UNSW Kensington is based, the Bidjigal people, who have cared for and safely traversed this beautiful country for thousands and thousands of years. And I pay my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today. Back in 2011, the World Health Organization, faced with an enormous burden of road deaths globally, most in low and middle income countries, launched the Decade of Action on Road Safety. Global activity was focused, focused around taking a safe system approach, focusing on strengthening institutional capacity to address road safety, build safer road networks, safer vehicles and prevention programs, many focusing on helmets, speeding, drink driving and graduated driver licensing for novice drivers, all known effective prevention programs. But nothing changed. Over that decade, now the numbers are even higher, with nearly 1.3 million people killed every year on the roads and 20 to 50 million more injured around the world each year. As things stand, road crashes will be responsible for an estimated 13 million deaths and 500 million injuries during the next decade and hinder sustainable development, particularly again in low and middle income countries. So at the end of the last decade, it was recognised that much more needed to be done. So yes, we have a second global decade of road safety with the explicit target now to reduce road deaths and injuries by at least 50% during that period. There's been a lot of global commitment to action. We have the second decade of action endorsed by the UN Nations General Assembly. There's renewed political commitment by member states and very strong foundations laid down by the last decade of action for road safety. We also see now the inclusion of road safety in the sustainable development goals in the targets 3.6 and 11.2 and a whole plethora of other activities, ministerial conferences, the appointment of a special envoy for road safety by the UN Secretary um, General and the establishment of the UN Road Safety Fund. However, to date, a lot of effort has remained around a world built for cars as the primary source of transport. The way in which most agencies interpret the safe system approach has generally been one that focused most on the private transport aspects and individual behaviour change. Cars, motorbikes and truck safety, safe roads, safe cars, policing and enforcement. And has ignored largely the other aspects so critical to safe and sustainable transport, urban planning, public and active transport. UNSW has a seat at the UN Road Safety Collaboration and I've contributed to their work for many years. So I've seen the great passion and energy from many governments, NGOs and researchers globally. But there really has been a huge blind spot about the elephant in the room and how to address this. That is, how do we move ourselves away from private transport? The new global plan for this decade of action, though, does include a new focus on multimodal transport and land use planning, which is fantastic to see. So reflecting this, this week it's the seventh UN Global Road Safety Week and the focus this year is on sustainable transport, in particular the need to shift to walking, cycling and using public transport while keeping safety in mind. With increased density in our cities and an urgent need to reduce private transport to improve city amenity, cleaner air and more opportunities for physical activity, this is something that governments globally have on their agenda. Some have done better than others. We've seen huge changes in global cities such as Copenhagen, London and Paris. But what about our Australian cities? We're certainly seeing more discussion about this in Australia, but the question is, does our action match the rhetoric? Today, we're joined by a distinguished panel to discuss these issues. Firstly, Professor Shashi Fang, Professor of Urban Health and Environment at UNSW School of Population Health. Shashi leads a program of research focusing on enhancing population wellbeing through identifying modifiable environmental factors like green space that shape health across the life course. She's multi authored many publications, more than 200. She's led major research projects and translated her research into policy. We also have Dr. Megan Sharkey. Megan's the Acting Director of Future Mobility at Transport for New South Wales, and she's also an adjunct lecturer at UNSW. She spent the last 15 years working in sustainable city transitions. transitions. She's a city transformation and transition specialist with a talent for connecting top-down strategic thinking with bottom-up innovation and behaviour change. She's worked across both 
private and public sectors in a range of different settings. She's just finished a PhD um, in transport planning, policy and politics, um, which was actually focused on researching government barriers to the development of active transport and identifying templates for change for community movement. So very, very relevant to today's discussion. And Megan, we know you're going to be on top of all the current literature. Finally, Last but not least, by any means, is Dr Lee Roberts, who's a research associate at the UNSW City Futures Research Centre. Lee is an urban planner and designer with more than 10 years of experience in all phases of planning, design and construction, including urban planning frameworks and policy, public consultation, design documentation and construction administration. Um, he's got a master's degree in architecture and urban planning and a PhD in urban design. His PhD research focused on the creation of urban rail trails and the role of active transport in public spaces. So again, very relevant to today's discussion. So thank you all. Really looking forward to this discussion and thank you all for joining us. What we're going to do to start with is hear from each of our speakers um, about their perspectives. I'm going to start with asking Megan Sharkey um, to present us with her perspective on the UN 7th UN Global Road Safety Week key message. There's a desperate need for governments and their partners to rethink mobility. Over to you, Megan. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so I work in the Future Mobility Transition Team for Transport for New South Wales. Now, the work that I primarily do at the moment is with automated technologies, electric technologies, some micromobility, and really other areas of future mobility. So it's my team's job to trial it, test it, strategize, and develop plans for how this should be embedded or not, as business as usual, across transport. Now, a lot of this work we're doing is looking at particularly the safety and sustainability benefits and disbenefits. And so what I wanted to highlight a few things is around where the technology is developing and some of the things that we're seeing emerging that you know are clear indicators of this idea of technology over infrastructure division. So at the Future Mobility Testing and Research Center, we do all of the ANCAP new car assessment five-star ratings and for example, there's a new technology that allows bicycle detection of the door in lane. So it sends either a warning or locks the vehicle so you don't open your door when a bicycle is in the car door. Now, why do we actually need that? Well, that's because a lot of our cycling lanes are in painted doors. So there's an idea of are we using technology to replace infrastructure? Now, a lot of the electric vehicle penetration are closely tied to automated features. And what we're seeing is that nearly all of them have higher levels of automation in them, whether that's braking systems, pedestrian detecting, looking at speed limiters, and another of those things. Now, what's important here is that a number of these transitions are actually looking at drivers think they can, the technology can do more than they can, right? So it's it's thinking that it's in a higher automation than actually that technology and then that has potential safety disbenefits for us and so one of the other um, areas that we're seeing emerging from here though is companies don't want people to own the autonomous technology and so we're actually seeing the subscription model um, come up because of software and hardware now why is this important well really this links back to when is technology not a replacement for infrastructure, as Rebecca noted? And we're beginning to see a number of sort of the limitations of where this technology can utilize in the infrastructure and the safety knock-on effects. However, one of the benefits has been is that we can now actually talk about speed limiting and the mass of vehicles. In Europe, for example, speed limiters and vehicle requirements are now trying to claw back the reduction in the massive size of vehicles, as well as make it requirement for all new vehicles um, and all vehicles to be retrofitted by 2024, which means that 30 kilometers an hour in school zones, for example, could become a reality that is enforced. Now, we are also looking at how this forward planning of the two technologies interacts with active transport. So how are these transition scenarios playing out? Are we looking at a vision zero decarbonized or are we looking at, you know, towards greater private AV ownership? And so these are the questions that we're helping the organization and road safety and the road safety action plan evaluate. So we're asking ourselves these different questions on safety and technology. So will this rising impact on AV and EV impact active transport transition? And what's the role of walking and cycling and mobility infrastructure 
as we move to a mobility as a service and what sort of policy and operational changes that we can do internally to help drive it. So I'll leave it there, Rebecca, um, and how, how we can talk about, yeah, where technology has failed and where technology can support. Thanks, Megan. I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating. It raises a whole lot of extra questions. I'm sure we'll come back to them. Um, I think we could have a whole, you know, two-hour seminar on technology um, and, and 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 the role. But um, thanks. That was absolutely wonderful. Now, we're going to come over to you, Lee, um, and ask you to talk about um, another perspective um, about to ensure safety, road networks must be designed with the most at risk in mind. Um, I'll just hand over to you now. I believe you've got some slides. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be here and talk about this topic. Since we, we just have a couple minutes, I thought rather than talk a lot about the projects we're doing at City Futures, which are not three minute conversations, I'd focus instead on kind of what motivates our work, kind of a big picture. Um, and the prompt is a great place to start to ensure safety road networks need to be designed with the most risk in mind. Uh, if we go to the next one, I might change that wording a little bit if I, if I was uh, the UN and, and change it to with a primary focus on the most at risk, just to make sure that vulnerable road users are the ones we think of first and foremost. Because unfortunately, that's not the way most of our streets are today. It's not even how a lot of our road laws or design standards are today. If I go to the next one. So, you know, pedestrians and cyclists are the most at risk of injury and death on our streets. But I, the fundamental question is why should streets accommodate them in the first place? Why design streets to be welcoming spaces for kids on bikes or parents with prams or people on mobility scooters? You know, we, we talk a lot about um, how when people ride more or walk more, it's good for the environment and it's good for our health and it's good for our wallets. And these things are very true. But good infrastructure that supports safe walking and cycling also really makes our city spaces safer and more enjoyable for everyone, including drivers and residents and people shopping and eating out and business owners. But I think there's even more benefit that comes from walk and bike friendly streets. That last one is a bike bus in Portland, Oregon, where kids can ride to school as part of a group. Um, supervised by parents or teachers. It's kind of like social infrastructure for active transport. And a bike bus is great for a lot of reasons, but you know, when I look at a picture like this as, as a parent, um, what I see is, is so many of the things that I try to teach my son can, could be learned on a bike bus like this, whether that's independence or resilience or social interaction or <laughs> just being aware of context and public etiquette. Um, you know, all those things are sort of wrapped up in this daily or week, at least weekly experience of riding your bike to, to school. And what I think, you know, if we ask these kids, I bet they wouldn't say that their parent or their teacher took them to school by bike. They would say they did it themselves. And I think fostering in that sort of independent spirit in kids is a pretty important thing for us to be doing as a society. Uh, so now next slide. So I just want to end my little bit here with this picture that hopefully a lot of you have seen uh, from a Swedish artist. So one of the key things about city streets is that they've always been the most important public spaces of the city. You know, it's where we see other people and where we are seen, uh, where we buy and sell, where we meet, we socialize. The street is the place where we as a community or as a society are created and recreated. Um, and in today's streets, where the space for that actual social interaction is this tiny, narrow strip of footpath next to this huge zone of mortal danger, that social interaction is stunted. And so one promise of prioritizing road safety and road design for the most at risk is that it creates opportunities and that, that sort of feeling of comfort on the street that's necessary for the sociability in the street to flourish again. Uh, so I'll end there. Great, um, thanks, Lee. And yes, that's an absolutely classic um, uh, picture that 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 last one, but really does reflect the reality. Um, and I know myself, if I sat out in front of my house working in the garden um, on the on the street front, you know, 
all sorts of interactions happen with people walking past and cycling and so on. Really, really important. Now we're going to hand over to Xiao, um, Xiao Jifeng, um, who is going to be talking about when safe walking and cycling can contribute to making people healthy, cities sustainable and societies equitable. Over to you, Xiao. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And good to be with you. Um, I have a question for our audience. Um, how would you rate public transport service in your local area? Is it excellent, very good, fair, or poor, or you have no opinion? That's actually the question um, that was key to a longitudinal study I led a few years ago in the UK. Um, let me see whether I can press the button. Okay. Um, does it work? Okay, great. Wonderful. And as you can see now on the slide, um, it won't surprise you to know that those who felt public transport was excellent were also 29% more likely to use it and also 53% more likely to walk or cycle for journeys of less than 5 km. As others have said, investing in public transport enables people be more active. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Um, so um, I'm here to say that the benefits aren't just physical, they're also psychological. Um, in the same study, I found people who use public transport more frequently felt less depressed or anxious than people who basically just use cars all the time. And when you consider the billions spent on antidepressants, time off work, the loneliness, and other issues relating to mental ill health, the results indicate that giving people options in public transport might support prevention. But here is a problem. Some public transport is better than others. Uh, next, please. Um, my result um, also show and suggest those who relied on poor quality public transport had 46% greater odds of becoming psychologically uh, distressed. Um, in other words, um, if the only choice is a bus that's always light or a tray that's crowded or smells bad, that's going to wear you down in ways that really undermine our ability to flourish. Uh, the last slide, thank you. Um, so um, if you can also press the button, thank you. Um, so I think the conclusions are obviously um, improve the quality of public transport and the people will use it. And giving people options in public transport may improve mental health. But if the only choice is a bad one, that may result in harm. Um, the bottom line is we need to make public transport the best quality option for people, for everyone to support mental and physical health. Thank you for your time. Great. Thanks very much, Shao. And thank, thanks, Megan and Lee, as well. I think we've got a good array of um, you know, research and thoughts, including from Transport for New South Wales, about how we go about addressing this. It's clear that there are many benefits to actually creating cities that, are, you know, have got great amenity, have got, um, you know, really important, you know, that we encourage people to actually get around um, on the roads safely um, and, and many benefits to that for, help, for health. So, Megan, let's let's come back to you now. As the Acting Director of Future Mobility at Transport for New South Wales, can you tell us a little bit more about the department's plans to create safer roads and facilitate active transport? How do, how do we get there and what's the government doing about it? Oh, sure, noting there's... also that you're not responsible for the whole government. <laughs> yes, yes, obviously. But there is actually quite a lot that's happened over the last two to three years in this space where it has made significant movements across the organization. So the Road Safety Action Plan is a clear one. It has a number of walking and cycling uh, targets and objectives. But then there's a whole suite of sort of other things, um, particularly that came off the back of COVID, like movement in place becoming embedded to support placemaking and look at the movement in place for, um, you know, where from a speed and mass and a 
um, a particular urban form, what sort of movement and place functions we have and how that results in healthy built environments. Um, another one is the road user space allocation, which looks at flip, really flipping that hierarchy. And so this is a policy to really help the organization start that change of flipping the hierarchy to think of pedestrians first and how this is actually embedded in now all projects over 10 million have to have these various sort of policies in place. So we're starting to see, you know, things particularly like along the M2 or out on the M7 where you're actually having segregated infrastructure that's of a fairly high quality. Now that obviously doesn't solve the strategic part. Um, but it is steps in the right direction. Now, the most important one I think, though, that I want to talk about, because this one's newly released and it has a real big impact on pedestrian safety, is new delegations giving local councils more control, which will make it easier for them to install a range of minor works on local streets by exempting these works from the local traffic committee process, which is unique to New South Wales. So this delegation of minor works will allow things like um, fresco dining on a road. So, you know, being able to actually narrow the road, which can impact slower speeds and make it more pedestrian friendly. They'll be able to do continuous footpaths, um, convert existing zebra crossings to the raised crossings, um, mid-block treatments, so, you know, chicanes, slow points, which would allow you to potentially create things like parklets or modal filters or other, other sort of things. Um, pedestrian crossing, refuges, and curb build-outs around intersections, which can be often a really um, dangerous place for pedestrians. So actually using curb build-outs to reduce crossing distance and manage um you know, vehicle speed. And then, you know, one of my favorites is to enable the increasing of tree planting along the street. So actually being able to reduce the traffic um, and then another one around parking. So I think that will have a really big impact um, because councils will be able to do this without having to go through traffic committees. So it could dramatically reduce the time and overnight, you know, councils could potentially roll out hundreds of these. So I think that one's a real game changer for pedestrian safety. It takes a very simple thing and actually puts it in the place of, you know, this should be a simple fix. We don't need to over govern um, a pedestrian crossing. So I think that one is probably a really big win from an infrastructure perspective that's happened in the last few months. Yeah, I mean, it does sound quite amazing. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think, you know, for those of us who like to commute to work on our bicycles as well, I'm hoping that actually creates a little bit of a, an opportunity for local governments to help create safer, safer pathways for people to cycle as well. Just on the on that subject, though, of joined up sustain, you know, cycle cycle paths, how far off are we in Sydney really being I mean, Copenhagenized? I know we had the Clover Moore taking, you know, Prince Princess Mary around talking about how Sydney was, you know, doing so well. And absolutely, we are seeing more um, cycle paths, but, you know, they're not necessarily all that well joined up apart from in the inner city. Where are we going with that? Well, I think you you may have seen last year, um, they did release strategic cycling corridors and, you know, some ideas on how to move towards that strategic element. I think if we're going to become copenized as quickly as possible, then it needs to be a combination of like this temporary traffic delegation. So streets become slower, more narrow, um, you know, that there's there's filters there. And then really trying to improve and roll out, I think the strategic cycling corridors as quickly as we can. Um, and some of that relates to as well, you know, having the community support for that. So we've seen if the community supports something, we can go much quicker. So. I think that would be a key aspect of this is, you know, enabling faster changes for this infrastructure also needs to come with community support for the infrastructure. Yep. And we will come back to that question about how we capture the hearts and minds of the community later. Lee, I mean, sorry, we'll go to Shao next. Um, and, and, and talking about green space, Megan's touched on that as being really important. Um, can you, you're an expert, Shao, in the relationship between nature and health. Can you tell us more about why we need green spaces to create active, healthier communities? Why are they so important? 
Great question, Rebecca, and also great to hear from Megan just uh, learned that council now have it more power to plant the trees and um, potentially make our community more healthier and better. Uh, so I think that is some really good research from all over the world, including from my own lab in Australia, has shown that the more time we spend in green spaces, the more active and socially connected and happier we are. Um, this translates into really important health benefits. Um, for example, my paper earlier this year suggested that just a 10% increases in the tree canopy cover uh, in a neighborhood may reduce the risk um, of ending up in hospital with a heart attack by 7%. And heating around 30% of tree canopy in a neighborhood also reduce risks of developing heart disease, diabetes, and even dementia. And this is after taking into account things like age, unemployment, and I would say lack of money and uh, education qualification. So obviously, a big reason for this is that tree provide shade and cool the air, uh, which makes it more attractive to exercise and also to be social outdoor on a warm day. Um, but there's also a lot of mental benefits to simply being in a green space um, and connecting with nature too. And I think this including like better sleep, reducing loneliness. And it all ends up to say that one of the most valu valuable things and you can do for your house is just simply to get into nature on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. We all know that feeling of getting out and walking through a park. It doesn't need to be a very big park, but you just need some trees, a few birds, um, even if they're, you know, bin chickens or ibis, um, they're still birds. So, you know, we all understand the value of that. Lee, you, you've sought to create and understand how we can integrate walking and cycling into urban spaces to create vibrant cities. How, what are the barriers we face to achieving this? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think it'll um, we can sort of dovetail with some of the some of the things that Megan was talking about. You know, I, I think um, it's it's inspiring to see what what transport is doing at the kind of policy level these days in terms of turning that ship of state, I guess, towards towards a uh, towards a, a better hierarchy in terms of, of road allocation and things like that, but. But I think that the um, there's there's also sort of a little bit of a it, it it is a big ship to to steer, and I feel like you know we still at, at the local level we're still bumping up against you know uh, a transportation planning mentality that is that is all about throughput and it's all about maximizing the number of cars through a particular intersection or a particular stretch of road, and you know uh, um, we talked about cars getting bigger and streets getting busier and all those things just add more pressure to a transportation planner's um, kind of plate and 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 more there's there's more pressure on them to to dedicate more space to cars um, and that means that when a when a community comes up with an idea for some way to make a street more more enjoyable for people whether that's wider sidewalks or slower traffic you know there there is pushback from from kind of transport at at various levels, and I think that the new delegation that Megan was talking about is a great uh, step forward. Uh, it means that more pr more pressure gets put on the local council to you know have that kind of proactive attitude towards active transport, but but we can you know maybe have faith that that they're going to lead us in a good direction on on those those small scale improvements. But I want to uh, also just refer back to the movement in place framework that that Megan mentioned briefly um, you know it's a if we if we think about it at the network level it's a it's a way of kind of looking at an entire network and strategizing okay which of the streets in this particular neighborhood really do need to be uh, fast moving traffic and and high volumes because there are streets like that right there there always will be but it's not all the streets and and lots of the streets in a particular neighborhood or a particular CBD could be repurposed to be more pedestrian and bike friendly. And, um, and, you know, I think when we, so long as we 
uh, approach network planning with that kind of larger mindset and and don't just say okay we're gonna we're gonna make everything pedestrian friendly and everybody throws up their hands because it means they don't have any parking anymore but if we say well look if we we do, we're not looking at particular streets but we're looking at an entire network and how that network could evolve based on how we actually want to use it and and the kinds of spaces that we're trying to create you know I think George Street in in Sydney CBD is a great example you know the city didn't hasn't fallen apart, you know, at having taken cars off of that one road. Um, but by prioritizing light rail and pedestrian movement and social space on George Street, we have sort of created this amazing new heart to the city. Um, and, um, I, and, you know, it's not the solution for every street in the CBD, but it's a, it's a, I think, a heartening example for all of us that you know, when we do prioritize social and economic uses on a street, we really can create places that we fall in love with and, you know, become the living room of the city. And it's not it's not a far-fetched Copenhagen idea. It's something that works right here. And, and that's a really, I mean, you know, fantastic example, Lee, I think, of where things have been really successful. And I, and I agree. I mean, I think there has been an absolutely quite dramatic shift in the language that's coming out of government, particularly transport for New South Wales and, and the City of Sydney around joined up transport, around placemaking, around, you know, building urban amenity and really actually looking at what makes the city, you know, making making sure the city works, but in a, in a way that the community wants. We need though, and when we know that to make massive changes like this, because we're not just talking about building a few extra, you know, a bit of extra infrastructure, a few more light rail, we're actually needing to change quite a lot. We need to change the way in which people move around. We need to get, you know, more people accept, you know, high quality public transport. People need to get on it. Um, people need to get on their bikes. People are going to walk more. But people need to accept, you know, people, pe there are changes that we're, we're making and there are things that we are asking of the community, um, asking people not to jump in their cars for those lo short local trips. Um, to do this, we need to win the hearts and minds of the community. Um, how, how do we do this? So I'm going to ask each of you to respond. We might go to you, Megan, first and just, um, you know, see, see what you've got to say. Okay. Um, I think there's probably a few things. So... For any of you familiar, the Streets for Shared Spaces program enabled us to do quick changes to show one, you know, sort of one way streets and, you know, roadside dining. I think we definitely need people to to respond to that. So we need some of those to actually stay permanent mm -hmm. um, because that's helping us with the, you know, behavior change and sort of thinking about reimagining the spaces and they can be done quickly. So I definitely think that needs to be there. Um, another one that I see emerging in a lot of my conversations, even with technology, is the idea of mobility justice and equity into our discussions um, you know, across transport. Um, and I think that's really important because most people are not transport planners, they are not health planners. Um, and those aren't necessarily the things they get. So I think there has been a real translation problem in the way we talk about these things. And yes, well, healthy streets are great. Actually, it's the mobility, just, justice and equity that a lot of them resonate with and the understanding of how we actually translate that um, into our community engagement. So into that practice based action research and that practical engagement. Um, I think that, you know, Oftentimes on this side, I see a lot of theoretical research, but more and more as a government organization, we are moving towards the idea of practice-based and community-based engagement research and how this is addressing you know, policy. And I think that's really important because then it allows us to have, my other point is actually those internal stories and those stories of change, because stories of change actually really do resonate and can be amplified. And so, you know, that, that's really um, important. And then the last one is, I think, diverse groups. Um, really providing this coalition, whether it's an electric or automated or the climate change movement, that there needs to be that coalition effort if you're going to want better and safer streets, um, because government can't do this alone. So we see where there's positive coalitions. Um, we're able to enable that change much faster and overcome, you know, what can often be a vocal minor minority rather than necessarily a um, majority opposition. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think equity is one of those things we haven't really touched on yet. And I think, I mean, you think about a city like Sydney where we have a, a large, you know, extremely large population out in the in west and southwest and northwest who actually have pretty poor access, might have pretty poor access to public transport. They're probably they're far away, further away from their jobs. People tend to actually choose, you know, people live there because their families are there and their communities are there, but their jobs might be somewhere else. They might have longer distances to travel. They might have cheaper accommodation, but they've definitely got longer distances to travel and, and a much harder climate as well. So they suffer more, they get greater air pollution, great, greater heat. Now that's that's they're the hearts and minds of the community. We also know we've seen during COVID that government doesn't always respond. Um, thinking about the whole of the community and thinking about the diverse communities that we have and, and how to actually work with them. So we do have some challenges there. Um, Megan, do, do you think, do you think is, is that something that you actively think about working with diverse communities? And again, I'm just touching on some of those lessons that we learned during COVID about actually talking to the diverse members of the community um, to actually say, well, what are your priorities and where, where, where do people need to get to and how do you want us to address this? So, you know, I can't speak for the active transport team personally, but in the role, in the work that we're doing with AV trials in different areas, we do actively go in, go, try and um, do customer engagement in those areas. So, for example, we recently did a trial in Devo and we did a lot of mixed mixed method community engagement to try and attract a diverse group who otherwise wouldn't know about this and actually reach out to individual partners through different methods. I think in terms of, you know, active transport, we're working on models that kind of step away from the old sort of, you know, um, origin destination and focusing more on activities. And what's that allowing us to do is actually think about diversity and equity a bit differently. So actually think about really activities that different sorts of groups do rather than a, a origin destination sort of pair. And that allows us to have different conversations around, well, what sort of infrastructure they might need and, you know, where they might be on a particular journey, whether that's electric vehicles. And I think if we can do that in a practical way, it actually has real infrastructure and policy outcomes because um, it allows us to make decisions better. So those are some of the things I think we're doing internally to try and move, you know, towards towards that way of thinking. Yeah, Lee, Lee, do you have any comments on that? How we win the hearts and minds? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I th I think we're still wrestling with <clears throat> and, and just thinking about locally, kind of push back against cycleway projects that are. Kind of ongoing now here in the eastern suburbs, you know, I, I think we still have an issue with uh, people not being able to to recognize that a pedestrian or a cyclist or a public transport user is just a regular person going about their their regular day. I mean, I think we maybe more so with bikes than than the others. You know, we we still sort of there is sort of the perception that cyclists aren't they're not quite normal. You know, it's whether it's the the group of people bombing around the city at 6 a.m. and matching Lycra or, you know, the, the delivery cyclist um, around late at night with a, his big backpack or, you know, somebody with, with zip ties on their helmets. You know, there's, there's still a kind of a public perception of cyclists as being some different, you know, weird or an interloper of some kind or in, in, some, in some way somebody we don't really need to care about, right? And I, I think um, for myself as an as an academic, but also as an advocate, I, I think, you know, we we have the power to influence those public conversations, to to you know to portray the the active transport user as as the same as everybody else, just trying to go about their daily business. And um, and you know, they're they're you know they're they're people first. They're people with a life, people with families, people running errands, people who have things they want to do. And I think if we can help influence those conversations to influence those portrayals of active transport users as being regular people, then then I, I think that helps in sort of winning over the, the, the vocal minority of people who are against active transport infrastructure. You know, if we can, if we can pitch it as it's just 
we're just all trying to get to our destinations with less stress and and less risk and uh, regardless of how we get there so absolutely and and Xiao, any comments from you um I have to think the major challenge is um, making this transition about public transport is by large currently is designed to optimize for speed and time. Um, but we all know that it's often slow and late, especially if you live in Sydney. Uh, and I'm not going to disregard you know, the speed and time very important to people. But I would like also say that other factors are very important too. Um, for example, how easy it is to get on and off and uh, can I get a seat? And if there's a Wi-Fi or any good, um, this is not bad. Do we even feel safe? Um, so in other words, I think there are many things we need to address uh, besides making public transport a little bit faster to improve the overall experience and encourage more people to use it. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, a very uh, bold that we are a coffee-loving nation. So why not offer free super fast Wi-Fi and also maybe discounted price, single, seven seats, you know, all NAN coffee, you know, fully um, biodegradable um, cups to everyone uh, traveling by train. And we just need to think about, I guess, outside the box a little bit and not be afraid to run experiments. Um, as doing, we know just having public transport is not enough. Uh, we need to make sure that people think um, it is a high quality option to drive a real change and it's good to hear, you know, Megan mentioned that, that there are areas they are actually doing trials such as in Duba for other reasons. So I think we need to try more and to see what works. Absolutely. I mean, there's all sorts of things we can do with tax incentives around, um, you know, e-bikes and things like that and public transport. But it's certainly um, actually making public transport free um, is, is also something that's likely to be a pretty effective driver of behaviour change as well. There's lots of, you know, especially with rising costs of living and people, you know, needing needing to get to work, then that's that's always a, that's always something that um, it could be helpful. I want to come back to safety, though. I think one of the big um, uh, focus, the areas of focus for this UN Global Road Safety Week is shifting to active transport but safely. We know that if a whole lot of people just, you know, come away from today and jump on their bikes, um, we're not going to see, you know, we're not, we are not. We are going to see more injuries. Um, we have greater exposure. If we don't actually make sure that we have safe infrastructure, um, we, we're going to have more injuries. We are seeing as well, I think you might have seen, um, there's been lots of reports this week about the fact that Australia's road deaths aren't decreasing. We're certainly not on track to seeing a 50% reduction. I think New South Wales is actually doing okay. Um, but you know we're not we're not really making any you know improvements in, in in terms of road safety. The other thing is thinking about most most of the deaths fatal you know most of the fatal crashes are actually in rural and remote areas. Um, so I, I think keeping that in mind, you know it's all very well talking about shifting to sustainable, active, and public transport. But how do we how do we do that for rural and remote areas where the crashes actually are? What what are we doing about that? Now I'm going to go over to you, Megan, because I know there's some work that the government's been doing in that space. So you might be able to give us a bit of insight. Um, so there's probably a few different areas. So my team often works with our safety division through the Road Safety Action Plan. Um, so there's a few of them where we're looking at, for example, a regional youth driver program, which, you know, there's a lot of the newer vehicles are safer for younger drivers. So trying to get them into safer vehicles when they're out on the roads. Um, we're doing some projects on level crossings. So looking at regional technology to improve level crossings to try and reduce, um, obviously, vehicle and rail potential collisions. Um, there's a few others specifically around black spots and by that i mean you know when we designed a lot of regional roads some of them where you know might have sharp angles or other things and there is definitely our black spot program which looks at actual infrastructure investments um, and then at the future mobility center we've been doing some other research programs around how do lane assist or emergency braking or other driver distraction can it support um, you know, regional profiles of, of accidents. So I think there's a few different things that we're doing there. But as you mentioned, it is, it's quite difficult because of the vastness and the amount that people have to drive, which I think, you know, driver fatigue is quite real. Um, and it's not something that we should ignore. And that is a large, you know, 
but a, a big factor in driving um, a number of those accidents is that driver fatigue. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Shao, have you got any comments about the safety angle? Um, I guess I have a, a bit of a curveball to offer here. Um, I think a big thing we need to achieve is a reorganization of our health priorities in how we design the roads. Um, as I mentioned that, that earlier, trees offer shade and cooler temperature and making, uh, you know, walking, cycling, and just being outdoor more bearable on warm days. Um, so, well, we're supposed to planting more street trees, right? Um, but, well, I, I, I think there is a problem because we're actually cutting them down. Um, and the, the road engineers often see street trees as liabilities rather than assets. And because if a person is driving too fast, or loss this control of their car and their risk of injury or death goes up and if they crash into a tree, right? Um, but the risk is actually very small, but the road guidelines advise not to have trees along roads for this reason. So this means we have lots of pavements and the cycle lanes totally exposed to the sun and also making it too hard for many people to consider walking or cycling, and increasing risk of mental illness, you know, health and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, such as such. And actually a study I have just completed in Sydney shows that when speed limits are less than 70 km per hour, having more street trees does not increase the risk of injury or death from traffic accidents. So I think in short, I, we we really should take evidence-based approach and to reduce our speed limits and the plant trees. And also, Megan earlier mentioned now some council may have more power about where they will, would like to plant the tree. And I don't know whether this apply uh, in those cases where they have a lower speed limit. Um, so it will be great to uh, learn more. Thank you. Thanks, Cher. I mean, I think that's a really important point because we do know that on highways, I mean, trees are generally regarded as being a hazard on high-speed roads as are, you know, concrete, um, you know, bridges and things like that. And you'll see there's a whole lot of work around motorways to actually clear clear the space around them so that if people do crash, they're not actually crashing at high speed into hard objects like trees. Um, but yes, you, you're quite right though, at lower speeds, that becomes much less of an issue. And in fact, trees pr provide much more, you know, provide more amenity. Um, and in fact, can actually, I suppose, could actually offer us, um, op operate as really as extra, extra devices to slow traffic down, if we're making that more complex traffic environment, helping to slow speed down. So um, really, really important. Um, Lee, before we sort of start wrapping up have you have you um got any comments about the safety issue about how we address that how we actually move to you know go through this modal shift but keep safety in mind what are, what are the important points that you might like to add yeah i mean i think um if we look if we look around the world the the two the two approaches that in, in improving safety on streets are slowing traffic and segregating different types of uses uh, on a street and i think you know it, it's a simple enough message that i think we it's Hopefully that that's clear enough that we can just say, you know, those are your those are really your two best approaches. And you know, if you've got the if you've got the money for a segregated in infrastructure, then great. And if it's a you know if it's a road with a lot of traffic volume on it, then that's your that's your right approach. But there's always the the you know much less expensive and much less kind of disruptive possibility of slowing slowing speeds using the sort of local area traffic management strategies. Um, and and quieting streets to the point where they're they're safer and more comfortable for all users. So I think, um, yeah, we just sort of have to hammer those those <laughs> sorts of messages home. I think that's right. And and of course it's hard and expensive to retrofit, you know, our streets. But it's something that we're, everyone's working on. Now I'm going to jump to some of the audience questions because we've got some. One for you, Megan. You touched on tactical urbanisation. Great to see the angle you're using with council planners. Although, how are you going to approach getting councils? mayors in particular over the line to actually take action and install these improvements. Yeah, so I, I think on that, you know, this transport delegation will enable more pedestrian crossings. You know, my my suggestion is if this is someone who is a advocate or a practitioner trying to get one, um, there's probably a few different ways. You'll often find that, you know, pedestrian crossings do have a lot of allies inside the council and previously traffic committees 
you know, could be a difficult, very difficult place to get through. Um, you know, so whether it's starting a petition for the crossing and get your neighbors and send it there using uh, some of the apps that you can take a photo of your missing footpath, you know, and send it to that council, you know, going to your local counselor. Um, and, you know, if you get somewhere near a school with a lot of support, I think you'll find that um, these are probably less contentious than some of the other difficult things. And they're an easy fix. And so don't underestimate um, previous difficulty through the traffic committee. So I think yep. a few councils will have to go first and then that'll be a great showpiece and a lot more will will take note of it. Absolutely. Now we, we've got some um, other, you know, some great tips there for people um, on how we might do that. And it is about winning the hearts and minds as well um, of the community and having community action is going to drive local council support. Absolutely. I mean, I think a, a lot of these, you know, these are elected officials. It's just about making sure that you've got a, you know, you've got a voice and probably quite a loud one. Um, I think there's another question about um, we've got a lot of commuting cyclists and bikes travelling at higher speeds on our bike paths. So we've got a lot of shared bike paths. We have, you know, we have some dedicated cycle paths, but we have shared bike paths. It's certainly a source of frustration for some in the community about that that balance. And and Lee, you might want to comment on this. How do we handle this with a mix of these type of riders with, I mean, slower recreational riders, you know, pedestrians with dogs. Um, you know, there's cyclist highways in other settings. Is that something we should be looking at here? Yeah, I mean, I think on on the topic of shared shared paths, they're really, I mean, they're they're kind of a quick and easy fix for you know, but they're but they're really not what anybody wants. <laughs> I don't think, I mean, it's certainly not what a cyclist wants. I know as a cyclist on a shared path, I'm constantly nervous about, you know, uh, pedestrians who I'm sharing the path with and dogs. Yeah, definitely, it's it's not a it's not a great fix. And I you know I think. Um, it's expedient, but that's about the only thing that they have going for them as a as a way to 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 uh, improve our or to extend our networks. So I think I think um, the message from from everybody is don't do those and accept as the absolute last resort. You know, and and that if you can separate separate users, separate pedestrians and cyclists and cars all all from each other, that's all the better. You know. Absolutely. And, and I think, I mean, again, it comes to the question, I mean, even if you look at Sydney's geography with, um, you know, hills and rivers and narrow winding streets, um, you know, sometimes those separate that separation can be challenging. But again, I think being imaginative about use of one-way roads, giving up lanes of, you know, lane of the road or parking on one side of the road to create cycle, you know, cycle paths is something that we need to actually come to terms with. And, and again, all over Sydney. I think there's also a bit of a tendency that we have, you know, good infrastructure in the city centre. We want to make sure that all of our city centres, so Parramatta, Liverpool, Campbelltown, Penrith, um, up in the northwestern suburbs, all have the same level of cycle infrastructure and, and tree space and management as they do in the inner city areas. Um, because again, we we also we we then we we are creating inequities in society around access to to, to resources. We we I mean, there's some comments in the um, questions um, and comments about you know the the beauty of riding a bike as opposed to public transport certainly riding a bike versus the car can often be quicker and um, a lot less stressful um, another comment again and something that many people you know find challenging is that balance between car mobility versus pedestrian movement certainly in the inner city but I mean I'm sure many of many of us in the audience know this where pedestrians don't actually necessarily have as much control over their traffic environment or the traffic lights as say or a, a, a motorist does. So cars get right away, pedestrians get 10 seconds to cross the road, then you get a red arrow and you've got to wait till the next traffic cycle, whereas cars can keep going on a green light. I think, I mean, I think that's something, I mean, they're the kind of things that, you know, we do need to change. And certainly there's some questions as well about, um, you know, um, liability and law as well who is actually responsible for protecting the safety and I think there's some challenges I mean there's some opportunities there to say well if you're driving a car you are responsible for the safety of all vulnerable road users um, on the road in front of you whether you're you know um, what regardless of what the law actually says you're in the bigger vehicle so therefore you're responsible for safety so there are some fundamental shifts like that changing changing some of those prior the priority of vehicles on the roads that I think are important um, I think, you know, I think we're just about out of time. What I might do is now just um, come back to each of you on the panel to ask, you know, for final remarks. For, for 
you know, talking to our audience here, um, what, what can they do to advocate for or be a part of transitioning to safer roads, active transport and healthy communities? So we might go um, to you firstly. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think we've touched on it a little bit already, but but I think speaking up in in various forums really always has value. And, uh, you know, for myself as a you know, with my other hat as an advocate, I'm I'm really aware of how much impact we can each have at the local council level. You know, in traffic committees at, or in a, in other forums. You know, I've seen examples where a single person speaking up in a meeting somewhere has, you know, brought about a significant safety improvement in their own neighborhoods just by just by speaking up. You know, I I think in my experience anyway, counselors and council staff really do want to hear from us, really do want to to know what we have to say, to to help them identify where things where where problems are. You know, they can't they don't have perfect vision. They don't have perfect knowledge of of every every bit of the city. So so they want us to to contribute and they want that sort of you know political backing to say this is a community supported idea. Um, so I think you know any chance we have to get up and speak at a council meeting or in a traffic committee meeting or in a have your say website is great. And, and you know, that's a that can be a daunting thing to take on, you know, to stand up in front of council and, and you know, present something. And, you know, that's not for everyone, definitely. But there are a, a range of groups, advocacy groups in every in every community that you could join that don't require that you're the one standing up in front of council. But, you know, a, a local bicycle user group or or white walk, walk sydney they they're always looking for people to support them to help them you know even just sort of identify issues or you know write a write a blog post well, not a blog post or an email or you know do the little things there are lots of little tasks that go into what an advocacy organization does and so we don't all have to be the ones standing up in front but i'd say you know get Get onto one of those groups, whatever whatever group it is that that sort of tickles your fancy or that you resonate with, um, and and keep working because because we do have voice we do have a voice uh, in making these things better. That's fantastic, but great um, advice, Lee, and I think all of us should take that to heart and really act on it. Um, Megan, anything else you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I'll I'll just echo it. Having worked on this side of government you know, writing to your state MPs and writing through those things, they do work, um, you know, because they do become actionable. And the more you have them, you know, the, the greater um, backing you get internally to do those things. So it is an effective, an effective tool to use. Thanks very much, Megan. Um, and Shao, finally from you. Well, thank you. I think this really great discussion. Clearly, we need more time for this very important topic. Um, I just want to keep it brief to say, you know, I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to reduce speed limits in our neighborhood, and we also want to plant more trees and not be afraid to try ways to improve the overall experience on public transport. Unless people advocate for those things, I don't see much change from the current situation, uh, which is to prioritize cars, chop down trees as if they are liabilities, and also consider public transport as a question of speed and time, and where you know humans get threatened, just you know treated just like a um, luggage. And the current way, I think, is not good for people, and also bad for our planet. Um, and we need to change this ASAP. Thank you, Xiao. What a great and strong final ending. Thank you so much. Um, thanks all of you, Professor Xiao Shi Fang, Dr. Megan Sharkey, Dr. Lee Roberts. This has been a fantastic opportunity to discuss, um, you know, sustainability um, and transport um, for the seventh UN Road Safety Global Road Safety Week. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the audience and get out there and start advocating. Thanks very much, everyone.